잘 들리나요? 아, 예, 감사합니다. 오케이, okay, so let's get started. Okay, so last time we covered the basics of category theory and we looked at the definition of categories, functors, and natural transformations. Then I said uh, there are two ways of understanding very abstract notions of a category, or well, actually three ways. One is objects in the category, we view them as space and morphisms as uh, good functions or structure preserving functions between spaces. So that's a one perspective. And then the second perspective, let me just put a reminder. And then the sec, we, I mean, I talked about three views on categories, and functors, and so on. And the first view was mostly about space and structure preserving functions. So they spaces form objects in a category, structure preserving functions form morphisms in the category. Functors do not really have a very simple explanation in this context, but can view them as transformations of spaces and tr which also transforms structure preserving functions. And the second view, which is based on uh, generalized partial order, we said objects in the categories are, I mean, the categories are just generalized partial order. So, in this context, the objects, I mean, objects were elements in the partial order, and morphisms are these less than relations in the partial order. The important bit is that this perspective allows us to view or match functors with what we already know. I mean, in this perspective, functors are generalized monotone functions. And then the third one was, I said, in the category spaces are types and uh, morphisms are well-typed functions in the programming languages. 
And then functors are type constructors. And then natural transformations are polymorphic functions. Or more precisely, parametrically polymorphic functions. Okay, so why I'm talking about this? I mean, one is to kind of give you an overview of what we have studied. And the second is that we're going to rely on this second perspective quite a lot in this lecture and perhaps the next lecture. And reminder and overview. And what we want to do, well, we want to, the, one of the reasons that we studied about category theory is to have a much more solid understanding. Well, in a sense, we want to show how to construct uh, domains uh, some, and it's, that's defined recursively. Domains and why do they exist and how to build them. So these are the kind of questions we would like to answer using category theory. And for instance, we when we studied about studied a programming language which supports failure as well as input and output, at that time we used the domain, which is of the form domain omega, which is isomorphic to sigma hat plus I mean z cross omega, and then also c arrow omega, and lift it, and then z hat, you know, omega hat, So you know, sigma hat is actually the two copies of the sigma. So sigma was a set of states, and this is sigma hat talk about normal normally terminating state, abnormally terminating state. The z cross omega talk about output, z arrow omega talk about input. But the in kind of non-trivial part of this omega is that omega appears on the left-hand side of the isomorphism as well as right-hand side of the isomorphism. And although I'm not going to talk about it very precisely, what I wrote here, which is this guy, I mean, actually including, uh, including this bottom. So what I wrote on the right-hand side here, can be viewed as, uh, I mean, can be written as an operator. So we can actually define a functor f on appropriate category, which I'm not going to talk about it now, but the category whose objects are pre-domains and morphisms are a bit more sophisticated. Actually, pre-domains or domains, I forgot, but it's a, some category constructed out of domains and pre-domains from domain theory. And in that category, we cannot define a functor and the right hand side it can be written as functor applied to omega. So this isomorphism is really telling us that there is a fixed point. Okay, omega. I mean, usually when you talk about fixed point, it's exactly the same. But in the category setting, exactly the same is almost the same as two things are isomorphic. So here we are talking about there is an omega, which is a domain that is isomorphic to f applied to omega, just like the fixed point theorem that we learned when we studied domain theory. Okay. So, so the question becomes why such a, I mean, when the uh, functor like f will have a fixed point of this form. So that's correspond to this first question. When is it going to exist? And the second, if it exists, how we can build it? I mean, is there, I mean, this is, we are not asking for an algorithm but we want to have some understanding about how to construct omega. Okay. So that's the second question. Furthermore, if you remember the fixed point theorem from domain theory, 
we talk about least fixed point. We are not talking about arbitrary fixed point. We are talking about specific fixed point, which is a least fixed point. And we, although we didn't do it very much, this listness plays a very important role in, in many contexts in the application of domain theory in, I like, say, program logics or verification techniques and, and so on. So the, we want to characterize, I mean, the, by looking at the construction of omega, we also want to characterize something special about omega. So, so uh, some special property of omega. And in fact, when we use omega, when we did the, in our, uh, when we studied about programming language with input output failure, we, I said something like omega is continuous initial algebra. And then we use this fact to define functions like, I mean, this double lifting and also a dagger operations, which define some functions from omega. So perhaps you forgot about this all, but we, I said there is something special about omega and that special property was exploited when it defined the semantics of programming languages. So we want to know when we can find the solution of this is a fixed point over functor f. At the same time, we want to know when this fixed point can have this type of a special property. And category theory will tell us about all this. And that's, that's why the title of this chapter is called categorical fixed point theorem. Okay, so now how we do it. And what we're gonna do is that we will essentially repeat the setup and proof or slash construction of the least fixed point theorem. in domain theory. But in a more general setting, which is in the set, setting of category theory. So if you by chance remember the list fixed point theorem in domain theory, as well as how the, the proof about the, this list fixed point theorem, you will see that what we're gonna do is really a generalization of everything that appears in the list fixed point theorem. Okay. And then in doing this generalization, it, well, what's gonna happen a lot is that we will use this second perspective, which is categories are generalized partial orders, functors are generalized monotone functions. Okay, so that perspective will appear over and over again when we do this number three. Okay, so let's then start the work. So, so the first thing, I mean, maybe I would just give a reminder. Oh, okay. I maybe just put an analogy. So let me write it like this, key actors. So we, we're gonna talk about the categorical list fixed point theorem, which is a generalization of list fixed point theorem. And then there will be, it's a bit like a movie. So there will be some actors that appears in this movie, in this theorem. And these actors, I, I, I mean, all, I'm gonna explain what those are later, but I think it may be giving you an overview about what those actors are, how they correspond to the key actors that appears in the least fixed point theorem in the domain theory, may have you, help you to gain some 
big understanding about what's really happening. So to do so, so to, to do so, we will recall key factors in the usual least fixed point theorem in domain theory. What are they? And so we have the theorem is have this form. We have a domain D. Okay. So D is a domain. So what does this mean? It means that D is a partially ordered set. And then it has list elements also it's chain complete. So every increasing chain will have a list of properties. So that's the definition of domain. And then the second participant or second key actor in this story is a continuous function. Okay. F is a function that goes from D to D that is continuous. What this continuity means? This continuity means that F is monotone. And then also the second property of our continuity means that it preserves the list of bounds of every chain. And then once we, we meet both of these requirements, the theorem said F under this one and two implies there exists the least fixed point of F. X may be fixed, which is in D of F. And then its meaning is that it has to be a fixed point. So f of x fix is equal to x fix. And then actually there is, I mean, although I didn't really prove this, I mean, this, this fixed point is a bit more general than what we studied. So I said, whenever we have a y in D, if f of y is smaller than or equal to y, that implies x fix less than or equal to y. I mean, when we studied the least fixed point theorem, we used equality here instead of uh, this less than relationship. But the proof of least fixed point theorem actually says something stronger, which is whenever we have a y, if applying f make y smaller, okay, then this x is uh, less than or equal to y. So sometimes people call it, instead of this list fixed point, they, they call it uh, this prefix point. And then the proof of this theorem is exactly the same as before. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe erasing this is a bit better. I, I want some space. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes called, uh, some people put words like pre here. Okay, so these are the I mean, key actors that we saw, the domain and then the continuous functions. And then the number three is, is the, the outcome that comes from these two participants, two key actors, or this is the statement of the least fixed point theorem. Now, how we can generalize this in the categorical fixed point theorem? So we write the key just in the categorical this fixed point theorem. Fixed point theorem. Okay. So what's we what are the key actors? And then instead of a domain, we're gonna have a category C. Okay. 
So then this category will have should have some property because I mean I said the, the good analogy or good view about categories is that it's a generalization of partial order. So by assuming we have a category, we in a sense can take care of I mean it's automatically take care of this partial order aspect of the domain D, but it doesn't really talk about having the smallest element bottom and also it's, it doesn't really talk about chain completeness. Okay, so we have a category, but then we will have to assume it has the list elements, and the list element in the category will, will correspond to the initial object. So we have to assume that our category C should have an initial object, so that will correspond to having domain D has the list elements. And this chain completeness will, will be translated into so-called um, the chain completeness in the category. So we will define something like a chain in a in domain, generalized, generalized version of a chain in the domain, which we will call omega chain in the category. Also to talk about chain completeness means that chain has a list of per bound and so, which means that there are two notions. One is there is a notion of upper bound, there is a notion of list upper bound. And we're gonna characterize them. So here we'll define something in category, we'll define something called omega chain. To talk about upper bound of this omega chain, we'll define some notion of cocorn. And then to say that this cocorn is the list upper bound, something acts like a list upper bound, we'll say it's a co-limiting So sometimes uh, people just say instead of co limiting cocorn, they just write the word uh, co limit. So it's gonna, definition will be a bit abstract, but a good uh, kind of things that will may help you to understand what's going on is that omega chain in a category is a generalization of increasing chain in domain theory. Cocorn is a generalization of an upper bound of a chain in domain theory. Co-limiting cocorn, what does co-limit, is generalization of co uh, the least upper bound of omega chain, of a chain in domain theory. So that's what we were gonna do. So we will learn already about this initial object, but you don't, I haven't talked about this completeness and these three guys. This is what I'm gonna define soon. And then also, so the, the first, the counterpart of the domain is gonna be a category which have uh, initial objects and also which has the property, which is every omega chain in the category has co limit, which correspond to co-completeness co property, no, chain completeness property. And then for function f, we, we said it has to be a continuous function. Something correspond to this small f in the categorical fixed point theorem is going to be a functor. So in the categorical fixed point theorem. So I said, when you view functor, I mean, use this uh, second perspective, which is the categories are generalized partial order, functors correspond to the monotone functions. So this number, the first property will come automatically because I mean, by saying we have a functor, in a sense, we are just saying we have a monotone functions, but it doesn't automatically have this second continuous property or limit or list of per bound preservation property. So we will have to make a, I mean, impose some condition that's called, uh, and I think this is called omega continuous. Okay, so there are some, so I think there are some synchronization problem. Okay, so it's going to be omega continuous. Um, sorry. <laughs> 
omega continuous. But essentially what this is going to say is that this bridge should preserve the core limits of every omega chain. I mean, that's exactly saying the small f is a continuous, means it preserves the least upper bound of every chain. Bongta being omega continuous means it's going to preserve every core limits of the omega of every omega chain in, a, in the source category. Okay, so now what's the, going to be the form? The form will be, we will have a, something very similar. We will have an objects in the category C. So if under the one and two, there will be an objects X fix in the category C such that it will satisfy these two properties of it in a more general form. So actually, let me just write it this way. I mean, this conditions is actually equivalent to say something. Well, I, let me take it back. Just writing equality is better here. So we will have an object in the category, so fix. And then this, uh, what this object satisfy is that the first, there is a morphism in the category C that goes from functor F applied to X fix to X fix in C such that this eta is an isomorphism. I don't think I tell you what isomorphism actually means. This means that there is another morphism, eta prime, that goes from uh, x fix to f of x fix. And it satisfies a few properties, which is that if you compose eta prime and eta, that's an identity morphism. Eta and eta prime, that's also an identity morphism. So that's exactly the intuitive, I mean, intuitions behind the notion of isomorphism. We have essentially inverse map. And this is a categorical formulation of this notion of having inverse map. And the second property, so that whenever we have uh, objects, we have a object Y, which is an object in the category C. And whenever we have a morphism uh, F, or not just F, maybe rho, that's a morphism that goes from F of Y to y, I mean isomorphism. In the category C, so that's like saying f of y is smaller than equal to y. Then there exists a unique morphism h that goes from x fixed to y, such that the following diagram commutes. We have a, a f of x fix, a, no, not h, it's eta x, X. And then f of y, rho y. And there's an h, f of h. This commutes. So the things are a bit complex. I mean, in the normal least fixed point theorem, we just said the x fix is smaller than or equal to y. In the categorical setting, we, we have to say something of that kind, which corresponds to claiming there exists H. But we also have to make sure 
all these the morphisms are I mean, compatible with each other. So these conditions that I wrote at the bottom, okay, this is saying there are morphisms which in a sense uh, provide the reasons why something is smaller than the other. And these reasons are, may have a compatible with each other. So that's the, the categorical generalization. So I didn't explain anything that appears here. So I'm sure you're gonna, you don't fully understand what's really going on. But what I want to see is that this, these looks very, very similar to you know, what I, the red part of what I wrote looks very similar to the black part, which you studied before. It's a generalization. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we will define, I mean, some actors that appears here, like we'll define this omega chain, cocon, co-limiting cocon, and also I'm gonna define this idea of omega continuous factors. And, and then I will go back to the proof that is theorem again, and then I will give you the proof about maybe I'll give you an entire proof or maybe kind of sketch the key idea of the proof of this categorical list fixed point theorem. Uh, by the way, before actually moving it, let me mention one thing. Uh, let's just write it like this two, so number two. So write one thing, which is that, I mean, this is a very general theorem. And then there is a way to, I mean, to construct the recursively defined domain, we have to instantiate them. Domain theory. And there are multiple ways of instantiating for, I mean, to, for, for this general setup for the domain theory. And something that will play an important role there is something called the embedding projection pair. And this is related to, I mean, very unlikely any of you took a course on program analysis, but this embedding projection pair is very much related to the Galois connections that appears in the uh, program analysis course. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, uh, this later. Okay, so let's start. So then to look at this definition. So we're gonna look at the definition of omega chain and cocon and co-limiting or sometimes it is briefly is called a co-limit. So the setup that we are using here is we are assuming there is a category C. And then we want to define something called omega chain, cocoon and so on. So what is omega chain? Omega chain, on omega chain I write in like delta is, is a collections of uh, morphisms in the category C, but with which where it goes from Xi to Xi plus one for I and Right here, this, this one. Her i is a natural number, which is start from zero, one, two, and so on. Okay. So, so it's just saying that we have a collection of morphisms such that it's they are all uh, the end of one morphism is the beginning. The end objects of a morphism is the beginning of. Uh, a, a, a beginning object of the next morphism. So, what is that? Does this mean it's a family 
of morphisms. So it's so countable family of morphisms. Okay, I think the best way to understand what's really happening is to draw a picture. So the best picture of omega chain will look like this. I mean, as a diagram in a category, it have a object x is zero in the category, and then it will have morphism f zero in the category that goes from x zero to x one. And then we have another morphism f one in the category that goes from x one to x two. And that we have a yet another morphism F2 that goes from X2 to X3 and so on. And that repeats uh, the up to any, the, the for any integers, I mean, for any natural numbers, okay? So, so if you look at, I mean, remember, I mean, if you match what's really going on here with uh, what happens in the domain theory, I mean, this is very much like an increasing chain. I said this existence of a morphism F0 correspond to X0 is smaller than equal to X1 in the, step, in the uh, domain theory. So this is really saying we have a generalized version of increasing chain. So omega chain in a category is just a collection of a morphism with a certain type. But the best way to understand this is that is to view it as a generalized version of increasing chain from the domain theory. Okay. So what are the examples? So one, one simple example is that we can define a set of, say the first x zero contains element zero in the category of set. We can define omega chain such that x0 is the, the first element. The object, the second object is gonna contain zero and one. The third object contains zero, one, and two, and so on. And the morphism f0 will map f0 to mean zero. And then f1 may shift all of them. So it may map zero to ones, and then one to two. And uh, x3 will contain 0, 1, 2, 3. But it will shift again so that it maps 0 to 1 and 1 to 2 and then 2 to 3. So that, that's going to define f2 and so on. So this will form, so we have a, a countable family of sets as well as countable family of functions between them. And this will form an omega chain in a category. Not all omega chain will be of this form, but this is one omega chain. Okay, so, so then the next definition is what is a co-limiting? No, no, what is a co-con? Of an omega chain. Delta, which is fi is one minus in. I think I write it like this. So actually, I don't need to write this parenthesis here. Right. So. If I have an omega chain, with I want to define the notion of cocon. This is a generalization of uh, upper bound. Is uh, it's a, a family. It's a, actually a pair of an object y, and so y in the category C, and a uh, family of morphisms. 
which that's in GI that goes from each XI to Y. such that it has to satisfy some property. And this property is for every xi and xi plus one. So we consider these two. So there are two ways of going from xi to y. I mean, in this diagram, one is directly go by gi. The second is first we apply this fi to move from xi to xi plus one. So fi is from here. And then we apply gi plus one. This commutes for every i. So what does this mean? This means that we, so we are defining chord corn. And it means that we have an object y so y is a bit like a list of per bounds in from domain theory. But here we miss, and, and then there's the, this family of morphisms, which is a GI. They are in a sense witness, but they are providing the, the, the reasons why y is greater than or equal to xi. So y, so there's a y here, and it provides the reasons that this y objects is an upper bound of, uh, of all the xi's. Okay. But because the, in the category, we, we are not just having the order, but we have a morphism, we should have a, some compatibility relation, which is say, I mean, there may be, I can view y is greater than xi via morphism gi. Also, I can view y is greater than xi by, uh, by composing two morphisms, one is first applying this fi and then applying gi plus one. And even, although this doesn't really need to appear in the definitions, even I can think about going from xi to quite far using this i plus one, fi. maybe f i plus two. And then from there, I go to y, okay. So there's a second condition say for all these reasons compatible each other in the sense that if you compose f i with f i plus one and then f i plus two and g i plus three, that's exactly the same as g i. So every reason that explains why the, the object, this y is larger than xi, they are all say the same thing. So that's what this condition is telling us. So before moving further, I will give you one to solve some exercises. So prove so this is a condition that, I, that appears in the definition, but I said this condition implies what I wrote at the bottom. So this one is actually the same as GI. So here's an exercise. Proof. The below diagram commutes using the above diagrams. Because in the above, we are not talking about single, but many, many diagrams. So assume that the above diagram is true for every i, and then use it to prove that the below diagram is true. Okay, I will give you two minutes to, to solve this exercise and also maybe digest some of the things. Uh, three minutes. So if you have any questions, you can ask me.
Okay, so how to show this? Improving this is actually quite easy. So if you let's draw some of the morphism that exist, that exist here, which is GI plus one, and another morphism that exists here, which is GI plus two. So what do we know? What we know is that, I mean, if we compose FI plus two with GI plus three, that gives the same thing as GI plus two. So these two guys will be the same. That's because of the this commutativity diagram that's written on, on the top. And the same thing for this is second triangle as well as the first triangle. So here's an how you can argue this. We said, if you compose uh, fi, fi plus one, fi plus two, and gi plus three, that gives the same result as composing fi plus fi, fi plus one, and then gi plus two. That's because of, I mean, this the last triangle that, that where that commutes. So we can replace the last two bit, which is fi plus two and gi plus three by gi plus two. And we do the same, this time using a different triangle. So we, we use the, the second triangle here. So if you compose fi, fi, fi plus two, and then uh, this so they if you look at the red one so if you fi fi plus one and gi plus two that gives the same result as first applying fi and then gi plus one that's because of this uh, the second triangle and then finally if we put I mean, this fi and gi plus one, that's the same as gi. So we, by chasing this diagram, we are able to show the, I mean, the, 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 or the commutativity that I claimed. And in fact, if we have a, this commutative diagram, which can be decomposed into this small triangle or squares, which you know they are all commutes, from there automatically it follows that in the graph, any two paths will lead to the same morphism if you compose morphisms along the path. Okay. okay, so this is how typically do the proof in the category theory. Okay, so now we define the notion of uh, omega chain, which is the generalization of chain from domain theory. We also define the notion of a cocorn, which is a generalization of uh, upper bound of a chain. So we're gonna define the generalization of this upper bound, which is called limiting cocon. So the third definition, we said a cocon, which is say Y and then GI of an omega chain delta is co-limiting if some property holds. So defining this co-limiting property. And then the property say whenever for all cocoons, which is uh, V and H so for all cocons of the same omega chain delta there exist a unique morphism K that goes from 
uh, y to z. So, so far, so far what's happening and with some property. Okay, so far what's happening, the what's happening is that cocoon, I said it's an upper bound of a chain delta, which is x0, x1, and so on. And then we said it's co-limiting, which is generalization of this upper bound. And if the following condition is true, whenever we have a cocoon, in other words, whenever we have an upper bound of the same chain, there this upper bound should be smaller, should be larger than y. So that's why what this uh, the existing morphism, this morphism K telling us, is say that this Y is a smaller than or equal to Z. So, so that's, I mean, this, the, the morphism intuitively tells us why it's smaller than or equal to Z. Okay. So that corresponds to the notion of this upper bound. But in the cat context of a category, we have to say all these morphisms, which explains why something is smaller than the other, they are all compatible with each other. So that's uh, the next condition, which is from, from using, stated using commutative diagram. We say that for every xi and z, the y and z, we can have uh, two ways of explaining why z is larger than xi. One is just using this morphism hi from this cocoon, or we use GI from the cocoon of the first and then compose it with uh, K. Okay. This should commute for every I. So I hope you get some idea about how things are, gen how we generalize it what's really happening in domain theory in this context. The, the general recipe is that we did almost literally translate what's going on there into this context by replacing less than as a existence of some morphisms. But we have to put, so first we have to claim some uniqueness. Second, we have to put some kind of compatibility conditions, which is stated using this commutative diagram. So diagram like the one here, I mean, so diagram like the one here, and also diagram like the one here, these are stating these compatibility conditions. Okay, so the, often, I think the more common terminology for the number three is that if a cocoon has this co-limiting property, then we call it as a co-limit, okay. So, this one is up, usually called a core limit. And this is a terminology that you will see more often in the, when you look at the, the textbooks in the category theory, or maybe the categorical semantics, I mean, I mean, investigation of the semantics of programming languages. Okay, so the, I think the, here are just some non-trivial exercise I want you to think about. So suppose, Here are two exercises I want you to think about. The first exercise is that consider the category where it's, so which I call I and J, which is a category of which objects are sets, but whose morphisms are injections, not arbitrary functions, but injections. In this category, think about a chain and then think about what's gonna be the core limit of that of, of a chain in this category. So you can think about some chain x0, x1, x2, and so on. And then you can think about for this chain. You can ask, okay, what's going to be the core limits of these guys? So that's a some first exercise. Figure out what's going to be core limit. And some more easier exercises. Uh, some more difficult exercises. And now think about category of a set with whose objects are sets, with morphisms of functions. And in this category, again, think about this omega chain and think about the, the core limits of the omega chain. 
Okay, so I will give you two minutes to think about this. Okay, actually this problem is not very easy. And uh, for, let me just show you. So what I want to do is I want to encourage you to think about it for yourself. That may help you to digest this, def this, abstract, def I mean, this abstract definition. But I mean, I think the answer for, actually the second one is, okay. The answer for the number one it's very much like taking the union. It's not exactly the union, but that's very much like taking the union. If x0 is just included in x1 by injection f0, then you can identify element in x0 with element in x1. If x1 is included in x2, you can also identify elements in x1 into with elements in x2 and so on. So essentially, if you take a union of every or all of these, then you can construct the, the core limits of this chain. Well, but more formally, what really happened is that if you have something like this in the category of set, so then what you have to do is you take a disjoint union of all of those. So strictly speaking, maybe you can take I is starting from zero to infinity, which means that you just take a disjoint union of all of those. And then you quotient this by equivalence relation. Okay. So which means that you define an equivalence relation for this disjoint union. And then you consider the equivalence classes of this disjoint union. And this equivalence relation is generated by F0, F1, and so on. So we said this is the smallest equivalence relation which satisfies this property for all xi, uh, element a in x a and b in xi, if fi of a and fi of b are maps to the same. Oh, no, actually, I was not quite right. I think better way to 
say this is for every i, for every a in xi, for every p in xi plus one, if a fi of a, same as p, that implies a and b should be equivalent. I mean, I of A should be equivalent to I plus one of B. Okay. So that's the equivalence relation generated by this F0, F1, and so on. And then if you take a quotient on this, in other words, if you consider an equivalence classes of this, that's going to provide the core limits of this guy. So generic construction is that you put all of these things together and you define equivalence relation coming from this F0, F1, and so on. And then you take a, you take, consider only equivalence classes, which are very, it's a generic construction. But I want you to really work it out. So to see and how this all works out to get, to get a better intuitions about what's really happening. Okay, so now let's move to the next. The next one is that we're gonna now define the omega continuous functors. So now we are thinking about the following. So we are thinking about category C and category D. They are categories. And then F is a functor that goes from C to D. And if I use the analogy, C and D are generalized partial orders, and F is a generalized monotone function. Okay. And omega continuity is really about corresponding to continuity properties of functions in domain theory. So we said that functor F is omega continuous. If for every omega chain, did I say omega chain? Yes. Yeah. For every omega chain delta, which is of this form, uh, fi server i goes to xi plus one, every i in the source category C, okay. and for every core limit, which is y, and gi that goes from xi to y of this omega chain delta in the category C. This uh, other f of, so functor maps this core limit to core limit. So that's what this really is property is telling us. But if I write it more, Exactly. If we apply functor f to everything in this core limit, we will get f of xi to f of y. And there's something that appears in category D. And we with this prop condition is telling us this is a core limit. Of, but I would write f of lambda, 
f of delta in category D. And what is f of delta? The f of delta is it's a chain obtained by applying functor f to the chain in the category C. f of x i plus one. Okay. So omega continuity means any chain, omega chain in the category C, if and for every co-limits of the chain in the category C, functor f maps that co-limit to the co-limits of the corresponding chain in the category D. So C gets mapped to category D. And so this is similar to the idea of preservations of least upper bound when we define the notion of continuity. Okay. So intuitively, what this means is co-limits of omega chains get mapped to Co C to co limits of omega chains in D by F. So F maps co limits to co limits. So that's what this condition is telling us. And this is correspond to this idea of limit preservation, the least upper bound preservation. And so I have about five minutes and then I want to give you some intuitions about the, I mean, instead of giving actual concrete examples, I want to give you, I want to explain a little bit about some surrounding context that may help you to what this omega continuity condition really means, okay? So something that we can play with is that suppose we are just, we, are, we don't have an omega continuous functor, but suppose we have a F functor F. We don't know it's omega continuous, but we have a functor. And suppose that we have uh, in this omega chain in the category C. Maybe drawing as a picture is better. So and then we have an omega chain in the category, uh, category C, which means that we have x0, f0, x1, and x1. We have a chain like this. Now, suppose that we have a not, co not necessary co-limit, but we have a co -com, which means that we have something like y together with g0, g1, k2, and so on. And then every triangle that you see, and or actually every path between two objects leads to the same morphism I mean, by the condition of the co -corn. So this is Cocon in category uh, C. Okay. Now, because functor can be can work on morphisms as well as objects, we can apply the functor to not just the this chain that we have omega chain, but also this cocon Y. Okay. So if you do so, so here's an outcome we get. So we have f of delta. That is f of x is 0, f of x1, f of x2, so f of small f1, f of small f0, small f2. And then if you apply functor there, functor on y, we have a f of y. And same time here we have 
f of g0, f of g1, f of g2. So, and then it, it happens that this also is a cocon automatically in the category D. Why that's the case? I said, if you have a functor, functor has to preserve identity and the morphism composition. So that implies if you have any commutative diagram in the source category, functor will map it to the commutative diagram in the target category, which means that I mean, we, we know every triangle here commutes that, and that because F is a functor, the corresponding triangle in the target, they will all gonna be commute here. So what we get on the, as an output, is going to be a cocorn in, in D automatically by the definition of the F being a functor. And this situation is very similar to what happens in the domain theory. In the domain theory, If you have an increasing chain, so I write using A because if I keep using X, it will make you confused. So A0, A1, A2. So if it's a chain, and then if B is an upper bound, so B is a, uh, greater than or equal to A0, also greater than or equal to A2 or every element there. So then if we have a monotone function F, if you apply monotone function, this okay, small F and the monotone function maps chain to chain. And also monotone function maps, if I apply monotone function F to B, it's still going to be an upper bound. Okay, of every element there. So monotonicity is enough to say upper bound get mapped to an upper bound, but it's not enough to say if we have a least upper bound, these listenses may not necessarily be preserved by monotonicity. So really the, this preservation of listness is, is, is really the key property that ensures, I mean, that happens in the definition of continuity in the domain theory. In the same way, the mapping cocorn to cocorn is automatic if once you have a functor, but it doesn't necessarily preserve, the functor doesn't necessarily preserve this idea of co-limiting property. And omega continuity is all about this preservation of co-limiting property. Okay, so that's it for today. And then next time we're gonna talk, I mean, I will look at this Categorical list fixed point theorem, and we'll look at the proof about this categorical list fixed point theorem. Okay, so thank you all for attending the lecture.